We are very honored today to welcome to Guadalupe College His Holiness Ningo Kense Nasir Muche. His Holiness is frequently requested for teachings, empowerments, and group in Bhutan and all around the world. And we feel truly blessed that His Holiness could find time to visit RTC today. We are all greatly honored by Your Holiness's presence. And I, on behalf of RTC, would like to extend a very warm welcome to Your Holiness and Your delegation. Catalans <laughs> Uh, so, uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank you. And um, as a Shishin Dharma Society told me to speak a few words here this today, and uh, most importantly, Royal Highness Ajikisang Ombawanchuk and uh, Tashu Tenzin and all the faculties here and all the helpers. I would like to thank you all sincerely because uh, giving me this opportunity to come here and to see the whole activities that has been um, done here. And uh, that I'd like to say it's actually uh, really excellent, this place, the environment, and all the uh, activities going on here. Uh, it's really, especially the area, so quiet and so pristine. I think it's so calming and really helping for the mind to concentrate. And uh, I think it's great. And uh, I would like to say that um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, I, I think maybe you know who I am or maybe not. It does not matter. Because I'm just going to come today and then disappear forever. And I may not need it for you at all. Because you are very clever with your what so called, uh, what you call a certificate with all those numbers and, and achievements. And today, uh, I wanted to actually talk about introduction of Buddhism and why I choose particular this uh, uh, what you call subject is Buddhism is really becoming a dying subject in Bhutan in Bhutan Himalayan region it is dying now and that is the truth Nobody cares about that. Everybody so care about business and agriculture and whatsoever. Nobody care about Buddhism. But actually, Buddhism, it is like a mother to all activities in our life. Business, society, tradition, mentality, everything. And we do not put any interest in this. And this is a big problem now. What is happening is that Buddhism is more becoming into a tradition, sort of a superstition thing. And then it's just slowly done by few people who know about it, few elder people, few people who are enthusiastic and more interested in it, and the rest, not so much. So it's just like a left behind. And that is what is really getting scary to all of us. 
because uh, Buddhism is not a religion. Many people think it's a religion, it's not a religion. Buddhism has many, many aspects, sometimes aspect of uh, what you call uh, uh, all these uh, pujas and ceremony. Sometimes it has the aspects of uh, really sort of concentrating uh, contemplation of mind and meditation and so forth. Sometimes it is the aspect of what you call uh, practice and, uh, and retreats and so forth. And then it is, sometimes it is the aspect of what you call this, like a uh, academic and more educational system, more intellectual system. So it has many, 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 many aspects. And uh, the thing is that, one thing re we're really forgetting is that if there is no Buddhism, very difficult to actually live up to that, to that level. Because until now, in our life, if you are a student, if you are a, a worker, if you are a monk, whatever, there always been Buddhism in that life, in that situation, in that circumstance. Because if there was no Buddhism at all, nothing will appear. And many people think that oh, that is rubbish. We don't need Buddhism. We don't need all of this. What you call Buddha Dharma, or whatever. I can do myself. I am very, very, what you call professional in this. Yes, you may be professional, but whatever professional it is, we all need a little bit of an antidote, like a little antidote to help us to go in that particular path. And that, for all of us, I don't know it is for the rest of the world, I can't tell. But particularly Bhutan, in this area, it is Buddhism that really pulls us into that direction. And we are really denying that at all from the beginning. So I am here officially begging you not to deny Buddhism. Because Buddhism is not just some simple little thing. Buddhism is not just, because nowadays, I'm very sorry, but many people, Buddhism is used as a weapon, as a uh, self, how to say, gaining sort of a, uh, method is becoming business, is becoming money, is becoming to attract people. This is not Buddhism. That is the total effect, that is the total defection of people's using Buddhism. That is not true Buddhism. That is not what Lord Buddha taught 2,600 years before. What he taught was the medicine. What he taught was an antibiotic to really clean our mind. And that is we forgetting about that. And most uh, people nowadays, students, I'm so sorry to say this to you, but I have to say it on your face. What is Buddhism to you is, if tomorrow there is exam, if there is promotion, I must go to Ngong Kang or I must go to Lam Chepa to ask for, for prayer. Or nava nga exam chap golo, nava ani promotion toblo, nava ani business benio, tari sa chipa, gongkang sa jogolo, ani kami jipugolo, ani cham chinte. And that is not Buddhism. That is the using of Buddhism. That is not true Buddhism. And that is a, like a small, small, small particular, like a small piece of how we see Buddhism. And when you look at true Buddhism, when you learn true Buddhism, it's a total different image, it's a total different section, it's a total different mentality. And nothing like that will really, you know, matter to you. So that's why always understand that whatever you do in life, education, especially now here, is education. So I can see that this area is great uh, environment for all of you to study and concentrate your educations. But with that, never to forget, if you are a Buddhist, if you are not Buddhist, it does not matter. But if you are a Buddhist, and if you call yourself a Buddhist, you must always know what is Buddhism, why we learn Buddhism, 
what is the purpose of Buddhism? Always to recycle that that uh, concept in our mind is very important because Buddhism it is our life. It is not a not a page we look at and we throw. It is our life. So it's something that we must think about if is uh, if it's possible for you if you can think about because nothing is going to confuse you nothing is going to confirm how to say a uh, sort of uh, harm you if you learn buddhism it is going to really reconstruct your mentality a way of living and a way of doing things so in that case that's why i'm sort of uh, asking you to really you know, sometime think about it, it may be good. And so, how to say, you see, nowadays, uh, I have been in many, many countries, you see, I can say that. I've been to Europe and America and so forth. The living condition, the living, what do you call it, uh, the quality of life in America, not America, sorry, in Europe, it is 10 times better than living in Bhutan, India, or Nepal. That I can tell you. The living structure and living society is 10 times better. But even though we have facility, even though we have system, even though we have everything great in the West, always uh, you know something we feel missing something is there is not there something should uh, be how to say like sort of inserted in that society and that we cannot find at all is not there is not does not exist and that is buddhism and that is what we have in bhutan you see um, in the west wherever you go is all about commercials advertisement, advertisement for fashion, beauty, and uh, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's, and whatsoever. In Bhutan, it's the commercial and all the advertisement about seeing temple, how to say, sightseeing in Buddhist areas, or Nekor, and all of this. Or you see posters of Mani Pime Hong, or these things. All of that is so much emphasizing on Buddhism, so much emphasizing on what we say, Vajrayana Buddhist. So really, there is a huge different impact. I am not criticizing the West, but my personal feeling is that, that because there is no Buddhism there, it feels something is missing. That one really important uh, sort of a source or root is not there. So this is what I felt, and it is very true actually. When you, when you are in Bhutan, you can really, you can sort of like, literally sort of eat or taste Buddhism in your own mouth, because it's so widely open, it's so widely emphasized and talked and mentioned and and whatsoever go on. So you see, appreciation of that, appreciating that, really gives us such a big happiness thinking, like, oh, that's so amazing. This huge difference. Why didn't I even realize that? This great, great and great, immense, marvelous gift for us. So really, I have come across that and really noticed this. And nowadays, you know, if you understand, His Holiness Dalai Lama is always mentioning to all of us, to everyone, Westerners, Eastern, uh, monks, lay people, whoever, he says, not just say you're practicing Buddhism and just do small, small like reciting Mani Pime Hong or just doing some Kora, but he's, he emphasizes and mentions to study Buddhism, to practice Buddhism, not to keep all that uh, 84,000 teachings of Buddha in your house and say, oh, I have all the all the gambu has the kanjul tenju in my house, but really to take that and really practice it and learn it. Because 
why he mentions so much about that is that Buddhism, for the Buddhism to live on, for the Buddhism to continue, only books and text is not going to help us. What we need is that mind. In ancient India, in Nalanda, in the Brikamashila, thousand and thousand monks were slaughtered by the Islamic, what you call, uh, fighters. But did Buddhism die? No. Buddhism came much more flourished. Is what we say, Tarshing uh, Jeba. It just increased more. You see, so that's why it really shows the impact of Buddhism does not rely only in some book and some text. We need to learn, we need to practice, we need to imply that to ourself. If you don't imply it, it's just a book sitting in your dax or sitting in your room or in your chesham. It is nothing going to, the text is not going to come to you say, oh please look at me, I'm going to teach you something. You have to go and learn it. But once we learn and practice, it gives us like a, like a diamond into, insert in our mind that it will never stop, end, finish, or get blocked or anything. It will just flourish and increase and increase. So that's why many, many teachers and many, many great, what you call, uh, tutors always advise and emphasize on that, to study and to practice Buddhism a lot as possible. And even if you see in the science world, science always have a limitation to their education or their knowledge. Certain things they do not believe in because it has no proof, no life proof, such as what you call, a, well, how do you say this, uh, like uh, previous life, next life, reincarnation, or what do we say, the clairvoyance, like uh, knowing other people's mind. All of that does not exist in the science world because they have no solid proof, no life proof, and they think this is a whole different section should be kept on sort of like researched. We cannot confirm that this is truly yes or no. It still can be researched. But nowadays, science have come to the point that the many, many teachings that have been talked in the Buddhism, such mostly, most importantly about the mind, where it talks about the mentality statement, how the mind works, mind thinks, is really now been actually in all the teachings of Buddha, now really slowly, time by time, the science have come to the point that they have realized that these are true, that these are not just some story or some legend, unrealistic legend. These are true, this is true. Buddha mentioned one of his teachings that the living beings, animals, the living beings on the earth and in the sea, in the water, he said it's much more in the sea rather than living in the earth. Nowadays, science have proven there are much more living beings in the water than on the land. So things like that, and things like Buddha taught about that every, how to say, phenomena is compiled of small atoms. And nowadays, of course, the science through all their technology and studies and research, they have come to the point and solution that that is true. So see, all the things that Buddha taught 2,600 years before is now slowly been proved by modern science with all their best, what you call, equipment and, and all of their knowledge. So you see, Buddhism, it is so vast and so, what you call, uh, modern. It's, uh, actually really something like a answer to all our questions. 
So that's why in Buddhism, one thing is not a religion. Many people think, oh, Buddhism is religion, Kincho Sum is a god, or Buddha is god, or, or what you call that, Guru uh, and God are same. That is not true. We do not have God in Buddhism. There is no God. We do not uh, sort of go up and sort of believe in a creator. Many people get confused. And the really simplicity in Buddhism, when we talk about Gurumbache, Buddha, Kunjosum, these are the simplicity we talk about that these are great enlightened beings, but they take the form of a human being to show us all that in order to become somebody or someone extremely special, extremely enlightened, there is a possible, there is a way, and the way is on this path. So any one of us can and for sure become like Buddha, without a doubt. Because we all have Buddha nature, even though we are very bad people, or even though we are good people, or whatever, we have Buddha nature in our mind, the purity, that pure, untouched, undamaged human mind. And there is a way to become somebody so special. But it is really up to us to do it or not. It's not something that we can just enter and we will become right away enlightened or we become right away amazing. We have to put effort and take time and how to say dedication and discipline and so many things like that, so many circumstances. So this is one thing I wanted to clarify. And now I can understand that everybody is getting really bored of my talk. And I am so sorry. But actually, honestly, you people are very boring. <laughs> and uh, one thing that in Buddhism really talks, really talks about, it talks about the mind a lot. And one thing very important to think about mind is that mind is so dangerous. Physical body is not dangerous. The mind is dangerous. In this entire world, in the entire universe, if you sort of compare to the modern world weapon, you see all the missile and atomic bomb and whatsoever, or poison, these are nothing. These are like toy compared to the, our human mind. Human mind is the most deadliest weapon in the entire universe. One mind can destroy everything. So mind is number one priority. Mind is number one priority to be kept well, to be organized well, to be cleaned, prepare, organize, systemize, finish. Train, keep clean, wash all the dirt. Because if the mind goes in a different way, then everything happen will everything will go in such a destruction world. You see, until now, in this world, we had uh, problems. We had so much of conflict. There is the World War One, World War Two, and all of this conflict going on. Why did this all start? It started because of people's mind, the mind's hatred mind's aggression, the mind's, how to say, uncontentment of wanting more, the mind's ignorant thought of superior, all of this built up that ambition and made everything so possible, made all everything so destructible. You see, it's, not, it's the mind, it is not the, not the phenomena that does the damage, it's the mind who does the damage. So always very careful with mind. You see, if I had a choice, if I had a choice to like, how to say, wash, I would like to take my mind out and sort of wash and wash 
and wash for a few hundred years to get all the dirt out because I am so disgusted with my mind. Because my mind is so horrible. I look so great. I look so proper. I look so oh, very nice whatsoever. But my mind is so disgusting that each time when I look at it in my mind, I want to vomit because it's so terrible. And now, because of Buddhism, because of my teacher, because of my tutor, because of the environment, because of learning, practicing many years, really made me think that even though mind is so terrible and horrible, there is the way to cure it, to cure it one by one, to restruct, to reconstruct, to restabilize it one by one. So not to feel bad and not to feel guilty and not to feel sort of like uh, uh, damaged, that there is a possible way to fix it. So this was really what happened to my understanding, even though it's a very, very tiny understanding, but this is what I saw in my own way. You see, it is so interesting how the mind can play, you see. Like, uh, I can be talking to somebody and uh, I could say to that person, oh, uh, oh, thank you so much of your time. I'm so happy to see you. That is a lie. That is the biggest lie my mind did. My mind told me to do it to say thank you, have, so nice to see you, so that I can just shut that person and make him go. You see, the mind is so clever how it can move, you see. For instance, like in a relationship, when you have two people liking each other, always the mind plays a trick of saying, oh, is this the right thing? Or is this proper? And then always this thing of self-importance comes up. Saying, if anything will happen to me, or am I going to be in shameful, or am I going to be a problem? So then all of this mind trick really destroys everything. So you see, one thing you must understand that the mind is creating everything. It really creates everything in our life. Since young age till your adult time, all of that achievement, uh, life, whatever experience, one thing you must realize that this is all the creation of your mind. Your mind, your mind made you. You see all of this. Your mind made you do all of this because this is the one, this is something that you wanted to do. This is something that you wish to do. This was something that you thought about and then the mind made you do it immediately so that you will not realize that it was actually your mind who did it. It, will, it just makes you think like, oh yeah, you did it. Or you're the one who did it. Or you're the one who achieved. So you see, if you really think about the mind, it is in a really amazing mechanism. So sophisticated, so amazing. You see, I could be talking to all of you right now. My mind can be thinking about each one of you, saying, oh, look at that guy, he looks so pathetic. Oh, look at that guy who looks so good. Oh, look at that girl, so amazing. All of this mind. Mind is so bad. You know, we can sort of make ourselves so fake, you see. I myself, my whole life, I have to live in the life of sort of like your I. So my future, my, not future, how to say this, my figure is your creation. If you understand what I mean. I am like this because you want me to be like this. Your I, your image, I have to speak in this way, 
I have to walk in this way, I have to dress in this way, I have to drink in this way, eat in this way, because it's your creation. I was created in your image. And every one of you are created in your own different image. Maybe in your friend, family, society, whatever. You're all sort of created in that system way of your own image or perception. And what Buddhism talks about is to break that, to break that image. Because there is no such thing as an image. Everything is projected by the mind. The mind projects it. So if you really learn about it, this is like an ongoing education that never will stop. And each time you learn more, it will give you a very wide range of understanding, education, and uh, how to say, mentality, and uh, intellectual. But at the same time, it is really going to help you in your own life. You see, this is the biggest gift. And actually, you know, this is something that many people, many of us, we don't see, we don't realize, we don't appreciate. And we start searching for other things. Like, uh, you know, I met many, many Buddhist students, very good students, and they tell me, oh, I go every day to see a therapist. I'm like, what? Why do we need to see a therapist when Buddhism is the biggest therapist in the whole entire world? And this is the problem. We don't realize, we are not learning anymore, we are not educating anymore. We are just keeping to a level thinking, okay, I am enough, finish. And then we have so much worries, saying, oh, problem, oh, mind, and this, and that, and this. And then we try to look for other solutions, therapists, and traveling, and uh, vacation, and whatever. That is not going to help us. The biggest thing will help us if you read, understand, and practice. That opens the entire world. That opens the eye to everything. You're very simple. Just need to take a little bit of time and discipline and dedication. Then it's possible. We don't need to spend millions and millions of dollars and money. We don't need to give risk to our life. Very simple, no problem. Just study, practice, and it will open up everything to you. You see, this is what is happening. Now, Buddhism, when I say Buddhism is dying, all the younger generation nowadays in Bhutan have no interest in Buddhism. It's understandable because the modern world is becoming so powerful. The modern world is like sort of pumping out, you know, pumping out all of this technology, accessory, and this, and that, and this, and this, and so much. It's like sort of like a, like a, you know, like a ball, not a ball, like a heart, you see. The heart pumps out blood. The world, the entire modern world is pumping out all of this advertisement, pumping out all of these things that attracts us so much that we are so taken by that. And it's so amazing, it's so shocking. You see, I was recently in Europe, especially in Belgium, and I was walking down a street, and I was so shocked that the whole entire street was sort of like a whole street of sweet. Chocolate, and this, and biscuit, and cake, and all of that, it's just all this. And I was so shocked that it can really create a totally different image. Do we get so drawn into that, we are so taken. And I see like many people get drawn into this and that and this and buying this sweets and that cake and this chocolate and that and this 
one thing I noticed that nobody actually knows. Maybe they know, but maybe they don't know that all of this is actually simply just to draw your attention. Nobody really notice about that. Everybody just don't ask any question and boom, go there. It's so shocking. And if you really look, now the world is becoming terrible. It's really sad, the world. Human beings, we human beings are so horrible. As I said, now everything is because of the mind. Our human being desire, anger, jealousy, hatred, ambition is so powerful that we want to make the whole world into that. I mean, think about it. In the big cities, you see, in the West, if there is a, everywhere is building and house and bridges, you don't see so much nature. And we try to sort of like, we human beings try to like, uh, how to say, reconstruct the nature, and that's crazy. Oh yeah, th that area has no, uh, uh, no forest, put forest there. That should be clean, no forest. We try to construct the whole entire nature system. That is impossible. And when we construct, one thing we don't understand is that we are destroying everything. Our greed, our greed is so powerful that we destroy everything. If we try to reconstruct something new, it's so shocking, actually. And um, and how we human beings like treat each other without any respect, and no understanding, no mutual understanding, sort of always competing each other. You see, everything in our life is competition. Since you are a young age. A little baby, oh, who can go to our ma mother and take the first milk? You or me? Or oh, then when you get a little older, who's going to get more money to buy a sweet or candy or ice cream? Or oh, who's going to get good grades? Or oh, who's going to go to college? Who's going to go to university? And in that study, oh, who's going to get in the best of school? Oh, who's going to get the best marks in, in, I don't know, mathematics or geography or history or what you call grammar or sports or whatever. Everything is so much competition, competition, competition. It's horrible. So much of competition that we become so unfriendly that it becomes like us and you, me and you. You are different, I am different, and this is no man's land. You are not allowed to come here, I will not go here. And it's so unfriendly that it builds up the entire circle and environment, such an unfriendly place. Like, I am the only one who exists, no one else. Because I am the superior one, and I am the, how to say, what do you call that? There's a way of saying it. The survival of the fittest, yeah. I'm the survival of the fittest, and no one else will survive. So much of unfriendliness. And the ones who are poor and a little bit and sort of educated are used for worker and all of this. And who are a little bit more educated are put in higher level. It's, it is the world, it is the society, but if you think about it, it is so sad. It is so sad how the world works. It's so shocking. In a short time that the world can change so much. Until now, from long time till now, how much difference, how much changing? And did that change become better or become worse? You see, it's really shocking actually. So because of all of this, uh, and even lamas nowadays, uh, this is the interesting part. Not just you people, not just uh, normal people. We lamas have to be more modern, you see. We need to know how to be more better looking, more fit, more handsome, more attractive, so that you will look at us and come to our teaching or come to our talk. If we are some old 
ugly man or talking. Nobody will look at us. Everybody think, eh, that's an enemy. Nobody even care about our teachings. And we have to look so proper so that you will actually come to our talks and listen to us. It is so difficult for me, actually, that I have to go through the liberty to actually be like you. I have to think like you, I have to act like you, I have to know all your tactics. In order to be like you, I have to do things like you, you see. And uh, that is one of the things, one of our responsibility that we need to learn like you. If we want to communicate with you, if we want to talk to you, want to share things with you, want to help you, connect to you, we need to be like you, exactly like you. And that's a huge difference for me. Big, difficult, but big challenge, but I have to do it, I have no choice. And if I didn't have to talk to anybody and just keep quiet in a little house and lock up myself for the rest of my life, fine. I can be like that. But I cannot do that. I have to talk to you all, I have to communicate, I have to help you, because that is my mission, that is my responsibility. That is what has been advised to me by my teachers, by the teachings and everything. So when I have to learn like you, it's so difficult. I recently was trying to learn how to, how to, how to say, dress like you. It was so uncomfortable to wear pants and short. It was so terrible, you see. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror because I look so ugly <laughs> and so uncomfortable. But this is a way to, con to connect to you all. You see, the thing is changing so much. Everything, Buddha, Buddha said very clearly, circumstance, the Buddhist teaching, Buddhism, is not fixed. Is not fixed. It can adjust in every circumstance. It can adjust in every level. It can adjust in every time. It can adjust in every mentality. So that's why Buddhism can be adjusted in any way you want, in any system, style, whatever you wish for. But it is Buddhism itself. Just the way of the style is different. It's the way of how you wish for it to be. And this is what is really interesting, actually. Many people think, oh, Buddhism is some, something fixed. And many people, I have noticed, is that when you do puja, or when you do puja or some sort of a ceremony, everybody sort of mentality thinks, oh, I need the lam chup ki laing, I chik lam mense. I chik di chika dara dego. That is not true. Pujas and ceremony is not our work, it's all of us. Since we are all Buddhist, since we are all followers of Buddhism, it is all our responsibility, not just us. You see, this is a big, big understanding, a big uh, issue, like a big uh, image to understand. And you see, now, sad part in Bhutan nowadays, so many young uh, kids are committing suicide. Yeah, that's extremely sad. And how to say, when you really think about it, even an animal, cat, dog, insect, beetle, whatever, even to the most difficult point, it will never ever think of committing suicide. Never ever think of that. Like we have really rare case for some deer or some antelope who has been extremely badly attacked by lions and tigers and left to die. So he has no choice of living, so he tries to jump into a lake or jump from a, a cliff so that he can die and he does not feel the pain. It's a very rare case, but in Bhutan is now extremely increasing. It's very sad. In life, 
whatever difficulty you go through, that you will go through, problems, confusion, all of this, there is always a solution, always a solution. And why is this happening? There are many, many reasons, and I don't know all the reasons, but I can tell one reason is that your understanding, you have to understand that whatever difficulty, as a human being, our mentality, we can talk, we can share, we can clarify, we can solve. So there is always the door, the door of solution. Number one. Number two is our teacher and our family. And sometimes things don't work well with family. Sometimes things don't work well with this teacher, and that can be changed. How can it be changed is the understanding of teacher. When teachers teach, it's not the responsibility of the teacher, only teach some, some school things and then finish. The students come to the teacher for really important thing. And many people don't know that, and I'm sure you know. I'm just, I'm just telling you. Many people don't notice it. They think, oh, these students come to me because they just want to do their study and finish. That is not true. They come to the teachers. Why? Because they seek, they seek security, safety, and confidence. The teachers are the one who can build, build that world of knowledge. Yes, but with that, they can build the world of confidence, happiness, Understanding, security, safe. It's not just some word you write on the black market and, sorry, the black board and finish. Bye bye. Not that small. It's so much bigger. So that's why you see, you know, in the monasteries, in our monastery, in all the monasteries, what we try to do is that when monks come to us, we know there are many reasons they come to us. But when they are in our monastery, in our compound, we give them the understanding and feeling that they are our family. If they have personal problems, issues, or study issue, family, whatever, tell us, share with us, talk to the authorities, the helpers, the teachers, the campers, the lupins, whoever are there. So it's not only that place of education, monk, system, Dinglam Namja. It's even the understanding that to become someone understandable, to become someone confident, someone understanding, broader understanding, you see. And that system is the same in the school, universities, college, schools, so forth. Students come to the teacher, and having the thought of the teacher is someone who teaches them, advises them, shows them the proper image. So then it is the teacher's responsibility to really make that in your mind, plan that in your mind, and really try to connect to the students. Because if you don't connect to the students, then nothing is helping. Students don't get educated, always have problem, difficulty, and there's always this gap. So must, must, number one, most important for the teacher, really try to communicate with the students, really try to understand to the depth of the depth of the deepest feeling, fear, understanding of the students. Because you have, you have the teacher, as a teacher, you have, I'm not saying I'm a great teacher, but I'm just telling you, as you are a teacher, you have the ability to help so many people to become someone so great, someone so amazing. So you have the ability to do it. You have all the necessities, all the abilities, all the strength. So you must do it, must do it. Because that's the only way we can change. And through that, the students have to change their mentality too. But a big, big responsibility, a big role is the teacher's role. So teacher has to be very careful, you see. And I have no comments for the family, for the especially parents and so forth. I cannot tell 
how you are with the kids. I'm sure you are very great with the kids, loving, caring, show, showing all your ways. But I must tell you one thing. I am not a father. I am nothing. I don't know anything about the kids. But when I live in the monastery, when I live with my monks, and when they become like my family, one thing I've noticed, and then the one thing I learned, never, never, ever make them do what you want them to do. Teach them, help them, advise them, guide them. Make sure everything is well. Then, let them born. Let them give rebirth to themselves. Let them be born again as the great one, as the great person in their future. So give a lot of effort, give a lot of time, give a lot of love, caring, everything. And give discipline too, of course. But then when they grow up to the certain age, and let them be whoever they want. Because that's the way how they can become somebody. If we construct them this, 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 you know, it's like when you want to grow a tree, you plant the seed, you make sure good, rich soil, sun, and then protection from animals not to eat, damage. So you do a few things, but then when the tree grows up, 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 and it grows, it will become into a flower, amazing tree, fruit tree, whatever. So that is your responsibility. If you try to make the tree go in that way, in this way, in that way, cut and cut and cut and this way, no, I don't want this to, you tie the tree to another tree saying, oh, I don't want this tree to go in that way. You will never achieve anything. You will never have anybody becoming anything. And I noticed that in our monastery. When you have a little monk, when they grow up, you teach them and beat them and scold them and tell them, oh, don't do this, do this and do that. But when you teach them in a way that you want them to become like this, that's so difficult. It is not so helpful for the student. But if you be nice, loving, caring, giving them discipline, giving them like a few, you know, how to say, conditions, follow. And when they grow up, grow up to the certain age that they can, be able to do something and then let them do whatever. Let them do. Let them show themselves that they are capable. And if they want help, they will come. If they do not, do not need, then we should just let them be, watch them, absorb them. And if they feel like they're doing a mistake, tell them right away, this is a mistake. But if you try to construct something that your mind and your vision and your plan, very difficult. So it's very, you know, this is something that's been well known. So I'm sure you all know about it. I think, I think it's very beneficial if you do it. I'm just saying that it's very beneficial. Maybe beneficial, maybe not. Maybe you all, uh, you all know this, so I maybe you don't need to say. But just wanted to tell you one thing.